So, our reading from Sunday was from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. I'll, I'll read that now and then we'll just have a short reflection on Jesus' words. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> you must be born again. And it sounds like a rallying cry for a significant party within the Christian community. It's a theme that's too important to overlook. But before I do that, I, I just want to point to some of the Old Testament readings. I haven't got time to read it now, but you may look back on Genesis and, and, uh, and in Romans. In Genesis, uh, the writer is talking about Abraham, how Abraham is blessed by God, and in him all nations of the world were going to be blessed, which is a, a promise pointing to Jesus himself and to all the, the things that comes to us. The blessing of God comes into the earth and starts to create heaven on earth, which is God's great plan. The blessing enters through one lowly old man, and his wife, Abraham and Sarah. The blessing is for the whole earth, for each one of us. It's a kind of seed, like fermentation. It's supposed to spread out and transform the whole world. The blessing is as far from a harmful virus as you can imagine. It's an antivirus. It is the blessing. We receive this blessing through faith. The blessing is rightness of living. Being at peace with our families, our neighbours, the animals and the very ground of the earth. The blessing. And with the blessing, Abraham's son Isaac found water in the desert and reaped a harvest in the middle of a famine. Sailing with a tailed wind, tailwind and the tide turned in our favour, it's all good. Paul spends a lot of time thinking about Abraham and the blessing of God. And in Galatians, we, we didn't read it, he says that this passage in Genesis is the gospel being proclaimed beforehand to Abraham. In you shall all nations of the world be blessed. But Jesus says, you must be born again. 
which is a bit more than a fresh start or a life hack. Considering that for many, this is one of the Gospel's big themes. The phrase is not widely used in Scripture, only three times, I think, in John here and in the first chapter of 1 Peter. Verse 3 and 23, uh, Peter uses. Paul prefers to talk about being a new creation. As I said last week, the problem we have is not just about sins, but sin itself. Our capacity to do wrong, to be evil. One of the startling conclusions, at least startling to me, from research, from psychology about people who torture others <clears throat> is that they're drawn from every category of human being, from every walk of life, from every political and religious background. There are no born torturers, they're all made. In the right circumstances we might all have embarked on that course of life. There's an American professor who, uh, I don't know if he still does, but for a long time began his lectures by saying, welcome to my series of lectures, I'm teaching on this subject. I was one of the torturers in Abu Ghraib that tortured and humiliated my prisoners. A startling sense that someone wants to confess and wants to make amends and is in fact in great torment about the things we've done. Forgiveness is only part of the solution. We need a cure. We have a deep-seated capacity to make bad choices and then look for evidence that we are in the right, filtering out contradictory information. It's called confirmation bias. It's the basis of all the <clears throat> The things we do wrong and cover up and of conspiracy theories and so on. It's so painful to admit we got it wrong. Lent is a really good time to ask God to shine some light into our lives. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night time, in darkness. Jesus later in his talk, again we didn't read it, calls him into the light. It's a beautiful story, a beautiful picture, as he comes in darkness hiding. And Jesus said things have to come into the light. This week, <coughs> last week in fact now, um, we have three stories in the media of one man sent to prison for an act of revenge, pub publishing pictures of his ex-girlfriend, bringing into the light things that shouldn't have been, but of course in the process exposing himself as a wrongdoer, as having broken the law, and was sent, the judge said to prison, as a warning to everyone else. One woman this week was sent to prison for manslaughter as she interferes with a cyclist who is cycling beside her and the cyclist falls into the road and is killed. I mean, to her, the whole thing was captured on CCTV with the sound. And whilst the first part, I think, was broadcast, uh, the um, detective in the case said that the whole video is far too awful, far too graphic to be broadcast in public, but was shown to the court. And of course, we're having all the stories of an MP who didn't expect his text messages to become public, to be brought into the light. I just want to caution you all, the first two have had a trial uh, through proper process. The MP has not been tried, he's been tried by the public, by public, by media. But let us spend some time in Lent to ensure that there is nothing in the darkness that needs to be in the light. Jesus says, you must be born again, born of water and spirit. John the Baptist, a few verses before this story, says that he, John, baptised with water, but one is coming who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. That one, he said, was Jesus. Most people 
listening to me, I imagine, will already be baptised. Last week, I was listening to a little video, and you can go online to um, Instagram, and Citizens Church on Sunday were having some baptisms, and there's photographs of young adults being baptised. It's, it's wonderful. But uh, Reverend Ryan said something in his video, said, tomorrow we're going to have baptism, you've got to come along, we're having joint services, don't come to normal place, come here to Cardiff, it's going to be wonderful. And if you want to be baptised, it's not too late. And that phrase really stuck in my heart, and I just felt the need to say now to anyone that's listening to this that is not baptised, if you're listening to me, it's not too late to be baptised. For those who have been baptised, don't forget that when we were baptised, Jesus opened a door to a supernatural world, and you can go through. I often think that when we baptise children, uh, it's as if a joint account has been open between that child and God the Father himself. And as that child grows up, they can open up that account. They can take advantage of it. We, we, we may set aside money. I don't know if it happens much now for, for people who are, uh, who are christened or baptised for the children so that when they grow up, there'll be some money for them for a deposit or for their education or, or whatever. Uh, a gift that will continue to grow and we can add to that. God has opened up a joint account with us and we should be taking advantage of that. We read last week that after Jesus was baptised, he was led by the Spirit. Who knows where he will lead us if we will only listen to him. Thanks be to God.